Jesus, I wonder what is going to happen. Something How do you follow up one of the most prestigious and important films of the 20th century? Well, if you're Disney in 2018, you make The Last Jedi. But back in the 80s, film production companies like MGM were still concerned with story and artistic integrity. So they followed up 2001 A Space Odyssey with 2010 The Year We Make Contact. I hope they never make 2020, the year we decided to regress back to plagues, inquisitions, propaganda, infantile behavior, cultism, and warring tribes. I don't think that title will fit Twitter's 280 characters, so I think we're safe. 2001 was adapted from Arthur C. Clarke's novel in 1969 by Stanley Kubrick and is generally considered either A, a masterpiece of intelligent science fiction, or B, a mystifying mindfuck of a movie that generally leaves you scratching your head and reaching for a bottle of liquor. Which one is correct? Yes. I generally love 2001 due to its conflicting themes, and depending on whether or not you're an optimist or a pessimist, you can see the ending of The Star Child in two different ways. Clark was an optimist, so he sees it as a rebirth, a next step in human evolution. Just like picking up the bone and using it as a tool was the next step in our progress. Kubrick, however, was a pessimist and sees humanity as nothing but babies, doomed like children to continue warring and killing each other, never to get past their petty squabbling. I guess we know who turned out to be correct. <laughs> in 1982, Clark wrote 2010 Odyssey 2, which is why it took 15 years between movies. The story itself wasn't written yet. He apparently called Kubrick and jokingly told him, your job is to stop anybody from making it into a movie so I won't be bothered. MGM backing a dump truck of money to its front door was not too bothersome, so a contract was signed to make the movie. Kubrick, however, wanted nothing to do with it, but Peter Hyams did. Hyams had a pretty good resume at that point with sci-fi fare such as Capricorn One and Outland. Is still man. Casting had Keir Dulay come back as Dave Bowman and Douglas Rain as the voice of HAL 9000. William Sylvester played Haywood Floyd in the first movie competently, but he had retired from acting by this time and was probably a little too old for the part. Roy Scheider takes over the part and in my mind is a much better fit, at least for the movie they made here. Rounding out the new cast is John Lithgow, a very young Helen Mirren, and Bob Balaban. In 2010, the failure of Discovery in 2001, which resulted in the deaths of four astronauts and Dave Bowman's disappearance, is blamed on Floyd, who has resigned from his position in regret. I didn't want your job, you know. I'm not the one that forced you out. I didn't blame the whole thing on you, so if this is your plan to try to get me killed, <laughs> you got the wrong guy. The Discovery has been, well, discovered orbiting Io, a moon of Jupiter. He's approached by a Russian diplomat and scientist who has a ship ready to go. They need the Americans to get on the Discovery as they have no idea how to repair HAL. The U.S. agrees and Floyd, along with Discovery designer Walter Kurnow, played by Lithgow, and HAL creator Dr. Chandra, played by Balaban. On the way there, 
they detect signs of life on Europa, another moon of Jupiter. They send a probe down to investigate, but it is destroyed. The Soviets think it was just a natural phenomenon, but Floyd thinks it's a warning to stay away from Europa. The possibility of life of some kind, where it never existed before. I don't think it's electrostatic anything. I think something wants us to stay away from Europa. After a dangerous braking maneuver around Jupiter, they find discovery in a giant monolith that the Discovery was sent to investigate. While the Americans try to get some answers from Hal before going over to that monolith, the cosmonauts decide to go over first because what could possibly go wrong? Max, get the hell out of there. Max! Whoops. Meanwhile, Dr. Chandra gets Hal back up and running and finds the cause of the malfunction. The government ordered Hal to conceal the information on the original mission from the crew, which conflicted with Hal's primary function of being open and accurate. This caused him to have the equivalent of a nervous breakdown, kind of like CNN covering Trump. Given full knowledge of the true objective and instructed not to reveal anything to Bowman or Poole. He was instructed to lie. I was told to lie by people who find it easy to lie. Hal doesn't know how. Meanwhile, the tensions between the Soviets and the Americans are ratcheting up at home and war is breaking out. The Americans are ordered to leave the Leonov and stay on the Discovery, but Dave Bowman appears to Floyd and tells him to get the hell out of there in two days. Floyd convinces the Soviets to work with them using the Discovery as a booster and then leaving it with the Leonov, heading the rest of the way home on their own. Chandra thinks of this as murdering Hal and tells Hal the truth. No. It is better for the mission if you leave. One minute to ignition. Thank you for telling me the truth. You deserve it. 50 seconds. Hal agrees to save the humans and Dave Bowman then tells Hal they will be together. The monolith has disappeared while millions of monoliths begin to engulf Jupiter, finally changing it into a small star. A message is received. All these worlds are yours except Europa. Attempt no landing there. Use them together. Use them in peace. The Soviets and the Americans are inspired to pursue peace by this miracle. Europa is transformed into a jungle with a monolith waiting for intelligent life to form on it, create civilization, and eventually destroy itself with Twitter. Two thousand ten is a solid follow up to one of the greatest movies ever made. Its main problem is that it's dated. In 1984, the Cold War was near its peak with no end in sight. Who could have predicted that by 1991, a mere seven years later, the Soviet Union would be no more? By 2010, the world we found ourselves in was so different than 1984 politically, it's mind-boggling. Anything else making it seem dated is simply a hazard of trying to see the future with current technology. For instance, by 2010, a CRT monitor was nearly extinct, yet they are used frequently here throughout. 2010 is a much more accessible movie without being stupid. The acting is much more natural and lacks the stilted performances you get with Kubrick. This isn't a criticism, but it does make 2001 sometimes feel like you're watching a documentary than an actual dramatic film. Unlike 2001, 2010 is much more unambiguous and definitely reflects Clark's optimism. The Soviet and the American astronauts are somewhat pulled apart by circumstances beyond their control, but for the most part want to work with each other and very little friction is evidenced between the two. In the moment during arrow breaking, Haywood and a female Russian scientist cling to each other in a harrowing situation. Two humans helping each other out despite political, cultural, and even language barriers. The special effects were also outstanding in this film. While there are some seams due to the era, several new techniques were used in lieu of blue screen for the ships. 
Blue screen was not used with the models so that the mats would not have that blue spill issue seen in movies like Star Wars. It doubled the processing time, however, due to the extra motion control passes to create a sharp mat. Space scenes were filmed in 65mm, which kept the fidelity sharp when downgraded a 35mm like the rest of the film. Although the floating pen trick didn't work so well on the glass, so they ended up putting those in later with blue screen effects. We have enough fuel in the Discovery for a launch. You have enough fuel in the Anoff for a trip home. Oh, sh you have enough fuel in the Anoff for a trip back home. Discovery. Will you? You have enough fuel aboard the Lianov for the trip home. Uh, <laughs> I'm so amazed by this. <laughs> we have enough fuel in Discovery for our launch. You have enough fuel in Lianov for the trip home. We used a docking ring in the Lianov to attach to the Discovery. And then we use the Discovery as a booster rocket for the launch. When we use up the Discovery's fuel, we detach. She falls away, and we use the Lianov for the trip home. It'll work. What many don't know is this film is one of the earliest to use CGI for a planet, in this case, Jupiter and its subsequent transformation. The original 50-foot model of Discovery was destroyed after 2001 as Kubrick didn't want anyone using it in various science fiction movies. The model makers had to watch 2001 frame by frame to recreate the model. Records of the Discovery were all destroyed, the Discovery miniature from 2001. Now, Mr. Kubrick was concerned about uh, the Discovery appearing in later science fiction films, so he had the models destroyed, all the plans and drawings were destroyed. But our main source of information is, uh, is a print of uh, 2001 itself. Sid Mead, the noted futurist, designed the Leonoff and the interior areas. Other than the 2001 theme used at the beginning and the end, the entire score was created with synthesizers, which gives it a very 80s sound. Overall, I enjoy this movie. While lacking the pure artistry and poetry of 2001, it does set up a solid adventure and attempts to answer questions from the original. This is an example of revisiting a beloved property, but not using any nostalgia in it. What's there from the first movie makes sense to be there in this one and is never trying to push any cheap member berries on you. Scheider puts on a solid performance, with Helen Mirren proving why she's had such a long career. Add in Balaban and Lithgow in solid performances, along with, hey, Dinkovich, man, the fall of the Soviet Union was hard on you. If you give 2010 a try and don't hold it up to the same standards as 2001, you'll have an entertaining ride.